Thank you everybody for joining us in person or in Zoom. Um, we're here tonight to talk about some schedule adjustments for next year, um, specifically the format and structure of our schedule for next year at the middle school and the high school, as well as our scheduling process, which kicked off this week with um, counseling being in classrooms and starting the process of meeting with learners. So we wanted to offer an overview of what the changes next year will look like, provide a chance for lots of questions from parents. We have provided a similar chance already to learners um, in the high school next year to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to the information and to have their questions answered. So we'll jump right in and at the end we'll have a Q&A session for both the live audience as well as the um, Zoom audience. I don't believe it's going to work. Here, I could just like do that. So um, we did share at the board meeting a presentation outlining the reasoning behind the schedule shift for next year. I had hoped to leave the seven period schedule intact to provide some consistency for at least a few more years. Unfortunately, with the budget situation this year and the need to find some efficiency, um, we did have to look at a schedule change as a way to do that without impacting the learners to the best of our ability. And I won't go back into that presentation. We did provide um, a good 90 minutes, I would say, of background. Um, both financially as well as educationally in terms of why that decision supported the default budget situation we found ourselves in. What I did want to share tonight is that our process through and through is always thinking back to our learners first and making sure that whatever changes take place will continue to support access to programs, access to um, quality learning time, and access to the teachers who can make sure that our learners um, are brought to the learning to the best of their ability. So we'll start with JRMS because next year for JRMS, it's pretty minimal in terms of the impact and change that those learners will see. Next year, we will be increasing from one instructional period, uh, excuse me, by one instructional period from a seven period day to an eight period day for grades seven and eight. What that will look like is an elimination of the current office hours timeframe and a reduction of about two minutes per class period from the current 40, a seven minute class period down to a 45 minute class period. That will allow for alignment to continue to be in place between the middle and high school schedules, which is incredibly important. We share a lot of resources. We function as one school and, and the instructional aspect of that especially. So every two um, JRMS periods will equal one CHS block. For example, the start time for period one in JRMS will be the same as the start time for block one in CHS. The end time for period two in JRMS will be the same as the end time for block one in CHS. That will allow our learners in grade seven and especially grade eight to continue accessing high school level courses where that's appropriate for them. Grade six will continue to have seven classes next year with the last period being a support period that also has lunch. So that will be the fifth period for our middle school sixth graders, which is identical to what they're currently doing now. Right now, our sixth graders have seven class periods and then a support period and lunch. Um, so again, not a lot of change for the middle school learners, which is why we haven't spent time with sixth and seventh grade currently to go over any schedule shift because it really won't impact their world too much next year. One of the things our teachers in the middle school are excited for is the opportunity for them to align like disciplines now that we have these two period couplets that equal a block in the high school. Some of them have expressed wanting to do more co-teaching. For example, I know our sixth grade math and sixth grade science teacher are doing some professional learning and planning on offering their, their sixth grade math and science as a combined co-taught experience, which is really exciting. For the high school, we will be shifting next year into what's called a block schedule. What that allows on the budget side, and again, I, in, the, in the school board presentation, we went into a lot more detail, Essentially, because we're increasing the number of instructional opportunities from seven to eight over the course of the year, that increases the amount of sections each teacher can teach by one, which increases our capacity and allows us to make some reductions without impacting class offerings. Block scheduling can provide some benefits to learning. There are, that's why a lot of schools at the high school level have moved in that direction, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And another piece that's exciting about this change is the alignment that it offers for CTE courses, which we share with Conval and Messenic. What it will look like in the high school next year um, is instead of having seven course periods like they have now, our learners will have four blocks scheduled throughout the course of the day. Each block will be 88 minutes in length, which is a little less than twice the length of their current courses. 
Some classes will be what are called skinnies, which is essentially a 43 or 44 minute period, depending on how our transitions shake out. And those skinnies last for either the whole year or half the year, depending on the course. Most learners will only have four classes at a time for the entire semester, which is obviously a shift and I think a positive one. It allows learners to focus on those courses a little bit more. And again, we'll talk about the instruction that has to take place to make that effective. The skinnies we'll talk about a few slides down the road, but those courses are typically things that require full year instruction to maintain continuity of instruction. Things like algebra, for example, would be a skinny um, that, that goes over the entire course of the year. For most learners, each semester will have an entirely new batch of courses, again, with the exception of those skinnies. I'm gonna turn things over now to our assistant principal of stu student support and safety, uh, Mrs. Summit. So an additional benefit when you're working in a block schedule is instead of having the seven transitions, you now have four transitions. And transitions in the middle of the day cause sometimes some issues with you know, social learning, some kids having disruptions, um, having that last minute to do a Snapchat or Instagram post. So what we've seen statistically is if you have a fewer amount of transitions, then there are fewer times that you have um, kids having some issues. So, and that's pretty consistent across the board um, when you look at data around the, around the country. So transitions, I think also help, um, you know, to have a reduced amount is, is that kids can focus and get a little bit deeper into each of those classes, as opposed to going, oh, I got to go to this class, this class, and this class. So kids seem less stressed because of the different changes and some of the anxiety. So that's a, definitely a benefit that I think the kids will appreciate. And we, as we've talked with the kids over the last week and a half, they are, they are like, yeah, that would, be, that would be nice not to have all those changes and things. So I think Mrs. Shulman will next because she'll talk about uh, how this is gonna impact with our, our teachers and their professional development. Hi. I'm Heather Shulman, Assistant Principal of Teaching and Learning, the best job in the school. <laughs> we have done so much research. Every decision we make in this building is based on research about what's best for our learners. The decision between a traditional seven or eight period day or block schedule is not one taken lightly. We're moving in that direction for the reason that Mr. Dustin referred to, but it is not a negative move. The research consists, consistently supports, it is not the time periods, how many class periods per day, it is the quality of the teaching and teacher's instruction, the quality of the active engagement, the kids are involved in the learning, the deeper they go into the content and the reasoning skills, that is what is the best for kids. It doesn't matter whether it's in a seven or eight period day or a block day. The time structure doesn't matter. It's the quality of the teaching and the ed educational experience. And that's where I come in as a support person. This week I've spent every day working with cohorts of teachers, focusing on revising, improving, their learning progressions, their learning goals, their activities. And I can say consistently with all the teachers with whom I've worked this week, they are excited to hear teachers say, oh, I can't wait for block. I can really go deep with this investigation of the flora and fauna of Mount Manadnack in my environmental science class. That is amazing. Things like that, extra time will allow us to study more deeply in different content areas. In addition to dedicated professional development time with me as a resource and working with their colleagues, Mr. Dustin and Mrs. Summy will be working with the teachers on specific pacing within the block. We've taught in the block, we've taught traditional, and there is a bit of a difference, but it's about the pacing and knowing that the traditional lecture does not have a place for more than just 10 minutes or so. 
within a class period. It is not time to teach two different lessons and then assign homework for them to, for learners to work on. No, it's a completely different mindset about how you um, pace the instruction, how you are constantly shifting active learning with reflective learning so that the learners are engaged. And um, before you know it, the time goes by so quickly. So Mr. Dustin, Ms. Summy will be working on block spot teaching strategies. And then we have an additional professional development day within the school day where the teachers are gonna be collaborating with their teams to implement all of this learning they're doing and create solid lessons for the opening of the school year. Okay. Thank you. So as, as Mrs. Shulman was just alluding to, we've set up knowing that the, the teachers are excited for the work and highly capable. I think we have an amazing group of teachers in our, our school here in the middle high school. I think that's borne out this year and how we've been able to focus on learning and continue to progress forward. And I would invite any, anybody to come into the building and, and see the wonderful things taking place in our school. We know we have the right people for the job. It's our job to provide them the time and the support so they can make this transition seamlessly for our learners. So this is just capturing what Mrs. Shulman was just saying. Under the block, we're really focusing on what the, the power standards are, what they're called, but basically what the most important pieces are to teach, how to use the time to allow learners to engage with that teaching, and then giving them the time together with support to plan and come into the school year ready to go next year. So our learners have already been informed of this because I don't want anybody being alarmed when they see their teachers out, but we have a schedule that's very aggressive and Mrs. Shulman, myself, Mrs. Summy, and Mrs. Baker will be busy supporting either subbing in classrooms occasionally or providing the, the direct teaching to support our teachers. Um, they'll all have two half days of PD between now and the end of the school year and one full day where again, we're providing sub coverage. We're spreading it out so that the English department isn't out four days in a row, for example, but we have structured it in such a way so all of our teams get this support and this time to do the work. So I'm Kim Baker, Director of Counseling, and I actually think I have to argue a little bit with Mrs. Schulman about who has the best job, because after spending um, the last three days presenting in 15 classes with Mr. Robertson, who's also here, one of the school counselors, I would say that um, our jobs are a little better than yours. It was really engaging and energizing to be able to spend that much time talking about next year, talking about the program of studies, to see learners in the audience tonight and hopefully watching from home is really exciting. So tonight I'm just gonna highlight a little bit about what we talked about in the classroom, um, highlight some of the information that we'll be sending home and sharing with you or what we hope your learners will be sharing with you because um, we know they're really great at coming home and showing you and talking about everything that they're doing here at the middle high school. Um, so the, um, the slide that's up here now just highlights some of what we talked about and we talked about a lot. Um, it was engaging, it was positive, it was helpful to hear and work with the learners. So we spent a lot of time talking about the program of studies, which you'll get electronically from me. Learners already have it. They have it in their email. Their teachers have added it. Their English teachers have added it to their Google Classroom, whether they're in the middle school or high school. So they already have access to it. And before the weekend, you will also have access to it. There's a lot of information in the program of studies. We know that it can be a little overwhelming. It's not a, do it's not a, a document that we want you to sit down and read um, in one night, although I would be encouraging learners to read it, for parents to read it. Um, one of the messages today, it was, in, over the last three days is um, we really want learners to be reading about the courses that they're selecting. There's a lot of really helpful information. Um, it talks about um, what learners can expect to learn in the classroom, what they might be expected to do. Um, and, and I'll share some of that information a little later on. We focused a little bit on graduation requirements, like what they need to be thinking about as they're choosing their classes. And depending on what, you know, if they're freshman, sophomore, um, junior or a, a rising ninth grader, it looks a little different than what we want them to focus on. But graduation requirements is probably something they're going to get sick of their school counselor talking to them, to them about. Every time we talk about courses, every time we talk about what's going on in the classroom, we talk about how that connects with graduation requirements. 
In addition to that, um, we mentioned something called New Hampshire Scholars, and that's something we want our learners to be aware of. There are four pathways to become a New Hampshire Scholar. Um, the Scholars Program is a program across the country. So when learners from Conant High School say they've been recognized as a New Hampshire Scholar at graduation at awards night, that they have a seal that's on their diploma, um, colleges, business and industry will, should know what that means, do know what that means, because it's not specific to Conant High School and it's not specific to New Hampshire. The, the purpose of New Hampshire Scholars is to encourage all of our learners to engage in rigorous, a rigorous course load, to challenge themselves, to take that extra science class, to take that extra half credit of social studies, to engage in world language. And I'll use for an example, and I use this um, today with the learners. Although um, we at Conant High School don't require world language as a requirement for graduation, to be a New Hampshire scholar, you have to have taken two years of a world language. So it's encouraging and recognizing our learners who are taking rigorous courses beyond what we require for graduation. So we see graduation requirements as our minimum requirement um, that's what, what learners have to do um, to receive a Conant High School diploma, but by excelling in other areas, they're eligible to be recognized as a scholar. We also want them to be thinking about life after graduation. What are they um, interested in doing? Are they interested in entering the workforce, the military, a gap year, continuing their education at a career training program, a two-year school, a four-year school? Um, always kind of keeping that in the back of their mind as they're selecting their courses, because all of those pathways um, may require additional courses um, than what we required for graduation, or it may frame the courses that they take or inform them um, on the courses they should be taking to meet their graduation requirements. And these are things as school counselors that we'll be constantly talking to your learners about. And we spent some time talking about that today. Um, and for our learners who are current freshmen and moving forward, um, for all of our learners, they'll actually are required to take a class called Freshman Foundations, and they earn a full credit for taking that class. And that kind of helps set the stage for those conversations. It helps learners explore their interests, the things they're passionate about, um, the things they're curious about. Um, it explores their strengths, things that they are good at, things that they're most challenged, challenged with. And from there, helping them find their career path, um, helping them develop goals, helping them connect all of that to the courses that they take here at both the middle and the high school. Um, so then we talked a little bit about prereqs, prerequisites. So as um, learners are choosing their classes, this is the other reason that we really want them to be looking at the courses in the program of studies is some courses have what we call prerequisites. You have to take one course before you take another. And we use um, some of our art courses as examples. We have both painting one and painting two here at the high school and our, our middle school, some of our middle school learners are able to take some high school classes. And so painting one is a prerequisite to painting two. So planning ahead, looking at that program of studies, I recommend that they, you know, write down all the courses they're interested in taking during their um, middle school and high school career, um, that they highlight it, they circle it, they write it down, and they use that as kind of a guide for figuring out when, which year they might take a course, um, all the courses they might want to be exposed to over the next um, four to six years. Um, and we also are in the process of having teachers make recommendations and learners got to see exactly where to go to see those recommendations and teachers will be making those recommendations over the next week. Um, and so that will help and guide learners in the process when selecting courses. But we also said to learners, if you're not seeing those recommendations yet in web to school talk to your teachers, ask them what they're recommended you, recommending you for. If, if you're recommended for a course and you're not sure why, or you have a question why you weren't recommended for a different course, engage in those conversations. We want our learners to be talking to our teachers about the courses they're interested in taking here at the school. Um, we also said, talk to your parents and guardians. We want our 
partners to engage you all in that conversation. It's really important for them to be talking to you about all the things I've already referenced tonight. And actually the form we sent home tonight with our learners that's due back next week, and I'll talk about those due dates, actually requires a parent guardian signature. Um, so that's helpful to us to know that they have engaged in those conversations with you. Um, so asking for those signatures. All of our ninth and 10th graders are required to select eight cr credits. And we use this word primary with them today, eight, prime, eight credits of primary request. That means your first choice. In a perfect world, they're gonna get all um, those eight credits. Those are All those courses are gonna show up in their schedule um, that we hand to them before they leave this school year. For our juniors, we're asking that they select seven primary credits and for our seniors, six primary credits. So our juniors can have some senior time, sorry, juniors can have some junior time, junior period time, block time, um, and so can our seniors. So that's why the credit amounts are different. In addition to selecting those primary credits, those first choice classes, the things they really want in their schedule, we are asking all learners to select two alternate credits. Um, and we talked a little bit about why we want them to select alternate credits. Sometimes there's a conflict where two of the courses that they've selected are offered at the same time and they have to make a choice. Um, sometimes a course might not run because there isn't enough learner interest. So we really want to know upfront so that when we're planning and looking at the courses we're gonna, we're, we will be offering next year in the schedule, we can look at both the primary request and the alternate request as part of that process. So we talked a little bit about the different formats with learners today that they'll be able to take um, classes in. And this is just an example that a lot of our core academic courses will be offered in that semester format. And we talk with learners about how there's two semesters in every school year. Um, so a lot of your, especially for our juniors and seniors, and then some of our classes for our ninth and 10th graders will be semester, like our Englishes, our sciences, our social studies. So every single day, 88 minutes for half the school year. Um, some of our classes will remain in a similar format to what we're offering now, and that's that skinny or single period. We use that term today, too, and they're year long. Mr. Dustin talked about um, Algebra 1 earlier in the presentation. Other courses like World Language and Band and Chorus will be that year long skinny. And all of this information will come home in an email. It's the same thing that we shared with the learners. So you'll actually see um, sample courses in each of these forms formats and then sample schedules. Some of our courses will be offered in a quarter format. There are four quarters in our school year. So a course may be offered for one quarter, 88 minutes every day for that one quarter. So we talked a lot about how our quarter three ends tomorrow. So if they had a quarter long class, that class would wrap up tomorrow. And on Monday when they came to school, they'd have a new course. Um, so examples of quarter classes are some of our UAs and electives, some of our art, our music courses are offered that way. Some of our social studies electives and science electives are offered in the quarter format. And our AP, which are our advanced placement course, courses, will be offered for three quarters. So right now they're all year, but they're in a period, a skinny format. And so by offering it for three quarters, the class wraps up just a few weeks before the AP exam and learners have more time prior to that exam because three quarters is more time in the classroom with their teachers. And those students will earn 1.5 credits instead of one credit for AP courses. Here's a sample freshman schedule. So today learners got an opportunity to um, choose some classes, look at some mock schedules. And so um, based on what a typical ninth grader would take next year, this is a sample of what their schedule may look like. So their English, world history, um, and earth and space science are all semester courses. Um, this learner would have both painting and PE, which are offered in a quarter format. So you can see how those work together. Algebra one and the freshman foundations and fundamentals of computer science are, are offered in a period format, either year long or for a semester. And then we have our band and our Spanish, which are also year long. So we talked a lot about how to take their requests and put it together into a schedule, like a puzzle. 
So this is a sample freshman, and then we have a sample senior schedule, which includes the senior block. So you can see the difference. Depending on what grade your learner is in, you'll receive a sample schedule for that grade. So if you have a learner um, in 10th or 11th grade, when we share information with you, you have the opportunity to see a sample schedule for that grade level too. So we just chose two for tonight to share with you. And then, you know, I think we said this multiple times with learners, but um, don't forget to review the program of studies to make sure that you're selecting courses based on your own interest, your own needs, and not necessarily your friend or uh, maybe who you think might be teaching a course that we really want you to choose what's in your best interest and what you're most interested in taking. Learners um, had an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to get into their web to school account. And we walked them through how to find their teacher recommendations. Um, you'll also get that information. So if they forget or they, um, you know, they don't remember how to do it or they need some more guidance in that, you'll receive that information so that you can remind them how to find that. On that same um, window in web to school they also have the opportunity to enter their own course requests so they're going to take what they put on the paper and put it into web to school and we practice that with them this week too um, and this just allows them to make sure that everything that they're interested in taking either as a primary first request or an alternate second request course is correct in the system and they can see it and they can refer to it and so we walk them through that process you'll also get those directions so you can help support them from home and then um, we talked about making sure that they talk with all of you um, and that you have an opportunity to sign that form before they return it next week. So I think I mentioned all the things that we'll be sending home via email. Um, and then also that we are, we are asking that all learners return their completed course planning sheet to their mentor teacher. Um, by Friday, April 15th. We're also asking that they enter those course requests into web to school by that same deadline. So if they finish early, they can drop it off in school counseling. I know that Mr. Haley, the eighth grade um, English teacher um, said that he'll collect them all. So even getting them to a teacher to get them to us is fine if that's what happens, but making sure we have everything next Friday, um, both the paper copy and information entered into web to school. So there were a couple of um, frequently asked things that our learners brought up that we wanted to share tonight before we jump into the question portion. Some of our learners asked specifically, they sort of calculated in their head as we talked about courses being one semester and then new courses the second semester. Some of them proactively asked, does that mean that I can take two of the same types of class in the same year? And the answer was absolutely yes. You know, right now a, a, a constraint or a limitation on our current schedule is science is the one that comes to mind most frequently. Because of how science flows, a lot of times learners will take earth science freshman year, and that's their whole year science course. Sophomore year, they'll take biology, that's their whole year science course. Junior year, they'll take chemistry, that's their whole year science course. So then they get to senior year, and if they're really invested in a field that requires science, they're forced to choose, do I take physics for the whole year and try to balance that with other pieces? Can I squeeze physics in and forensics? Can I take physics and something else? In other words, they're forced to make decisions because the science courses lasted all year. One of the learners gave the example, what if I wanted to do chemistry and forensics in the same year? Chemistry is usually required for forensics. Absolutely, you could take chemistry in the fall and forensics in the spring. As a senior, you could take physics in the fall or physics in the spring. You could take, we have, um, I think, four or five new science courses coming online this year. They were excited about the, the opportunity to do that. Another learner asked, could I take French three in the fall and French four in the spring? Sure. The point is with courses being only a semester long, learners can lock together combinations of those that would not be possible with courses lasting for the entire calendar year. And our learners were actually several of them in each meeting excited about that. That led to an interesting second question for upcoming seniors. Well, if I do that, can I just cram all four of my required state required courses in the fall and not come in in the spring? And the answer to that is no. There is a minimum amount of time learners need to be in the building with us. And we do expect them to take the minimum course load, which Mrs. Baker outlined on the previous page. Learners can still have senior release. 
and with work um, release privileges potentially being in place or extended learning opportunities and field experiences with Mrs. Jackson, who's our career and ELO coordinator, there are opportunities for learners to maybe be out of the building a little bit more senior year with a block, but it is not going to be acceptable to the school or to the, the policies and laws that they cram four classes and take nothing in the spring, for example. Um, can a learner have two blocks, two periods, or a block off as a senior? Uh, yes, we told them absolutely. Mrs. Baker talked with the upcoming seniors about that in her meetings with them. Um, again, there's more flexibility with a block schedule in terms of the signups for learners. So both juniors and seniors may end up with a full block, you know, each semester that they have as time to either be in, in the junior and senior lounge spaces in the building, which have been very well received this year, or for seniors only being off campus with parent permission. And then a lot of learners, it took a little bit of time because it's very new, really. So I'll only have four classes at a time, probably. You know, again, there might be some of those skinnies, especially freshman um, year where we're building in with those key foundational level one, two, three language classes in algebra one. There will definitely be some learners who have five classes, but that's probably going to be the limit, limit for most kids. Most will have between three and four classes at a time. So those are some of the things that your children kept asking us that we thought were important to bring to the table today before we jump into the question portion. Um, just to, to wrap up before we do that, obviously we know this is a pretty big shift for the high school to be changing how we do business. We did have a block schedule last year because of COVID that was an AB block schedule. That's really tough for learners because they still have all of their classes, but now they're trying to split the difference with time. This schedule is more consistent for them. We're excited about the possibilities. We're committed, as are our teachers, to doing the work up front to make the transition effective for your children. And our learners seemed excited about the possibilities. We're committed to making sure that excitement materializes in the fall with really quality learning that continues for your kids. So with that being said, we'll turn it over to the question and answer portion. And as, uh, yep, yeah, go ahead. Hi, so this is, uh... Nicholas Handy, uh, communications coordinator. I'm the one running the live stream. Um, just wanted to give quick ground rules for everybody. Um, obviously, if you're in person, uh, we have a microphone that we can pass around. You can use that. Um, please note that if you uh, use it, you won't be heard. It's purely for live stream purposes. Um, if you are in the digital audience, feel free to use the hand raise feature. And what we can do is we can address you that way, give you the ability to speak. Um, we can hear you in the room. We can answer your question. Um, and then if you've sent in a question via the chat, we can also try to address that as well. Um, so I'll, I guess we can take physical questions first, let the queue kind of accumulate in the uh, digital portion, and then we can go back, you know, go back and forth a little bit. If that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. We're just going to pass the mic to whomever is best suited to answer the question. So we're not going to be stuck behind the podium anymore. And that might include you too, Mrs. Summy. I'll be on my candling duty the whole time. Are you expecting that this will result in less homework throughout the year because the classroom time is so much longer? So I guess I'll jump in first. And again, this is part of the work that we're doing with the teachers is that they'll be able to use the classroom time to provide direct inst instruction and better facilitate learners using that time to complete other types of work. So that should reduce homework load and also going from having seven courses at a time to only four should also reduce the amount of time for homework. I obviously am not the, each teacher, so I can't commit to their specific expectations for learners, but generally the expectation with a block schedule is it consolidates the amount of classes and provides more times so homework should go down. Anybody else? I would just add that, you know, given the opportunity for the block schedule, you might have times of the year where they're doing, you know, an intense uh, summative that might require them to do some additional work outside the classroom. But I think that's going to ebb and flow with things. You've still got the mic. If you have more questions, keep them coming unless somebody else puts their hand up and wants to yank that away. So I understand from my learner that there's a number of classes that are now very limited in the grades that can participate in those classes, um, specifically in our instance, the um, journalism class, which we had mapped out, you know, she's a very bullet point planner 
and that was supposed to be a senior year class. And now it's only available to juniors, which obviously in April, you as a junior, you can't just roll into. So are there going to be exceptions for the seniors to some of those classes? So each team every year submits what they believe is the appropriate fit for their courses for the coming year. And that was done, you know, prior to this change to schedule. So I just want to be clear that any change to, to the block schedule didn't impact any decisions about course grade levels. And I believe that journalism might be the only one that I know of that had a grade restriction from 11th to 12th to 11th. Um, so that's a case by case discussion. I think your learner should have a conversation with counseling and we can take a look at that plan and consult with you. And there can be exceptions for that, especially for this year where that was a shift coming into this upcoming school year. The English department's goal, which I think is a good one to have, is to continue to move towards a model like we see with the senior English, where there's different options for 11th grade, just like we have with 12th grade. So instead of learners just taking English 11, which is that very traditional course, they, they can build in a choice that's more suited to their own interests. And that's where that shift came this year. But I would encourage your learner to just work with their counselor and have that one-on-one -on -one meeting, and we can make an adjustment for that if we need to. So there's a place on the course planning form where learners can write notes. And so when those kinds of questions were coming up, because they come up in a few places, like I already took creative writing um, and I want to take another writing class, what can I take? And if they're not seeing um, anything that fits what they're looking for, we ask them to write us a little note so that we would call them in and have an individual meeting to talk about options and plans and what we can do to support them. Do we need to have that meeting before April 15th? No. If anyone else has a question, just raise your hand and we'll come back afterwards with more questions here, but otherwise you can yeah, we'll just pass it over and then we'll come back to you. <laughs> Those have been questions though. Thank you. Oh, God. <laughs> um, can we just go over the skinny classes and the three quarter blocks again? Sure. Am I understanding correct that skinny classes are 88 minutes? for the time period in the classroom. Are all of them gonna be for three quarters of the year? So most of our courses will be 88 minutes, but just for half of the year. So most of our, our full credit courses, that's the format for them. And that's your sort of standard block. A skinny class is 44 minutes or 43 or 44. It's gonna depend on how the transitions end up um, being scheduled in the final draft of that. But it's basically a, a period, like, like what we have now, roughly 45 minutes. And it lasts for a half credit class that's a skinny, it's half of the year at 45 minutes a day. For a full credit skinny class, it's 45 minutes, but for the whole year. So algebra one for our freshmen will be 40, roughly 45 minutes for the entire year. And that way they're getting the same amount of instructional minutes that you would get with the block schedule, but it's stretching it out so that they can have the whole year to practice those skills and build a really strong foundation. And then in the following years where math layers onto algebra, they'll continue to use those skills in, in block format courses. The only courses that we'll have that will be the three quarters will be our AP classes. And they'll be for three quarters of the year, but they'll be 88 minutes a day for three quarters of the year. So the benefit of that is right now our learners at, in the same amount of time are only getting 47 minutes a day or, or something like that for that time period before the exam. We're literally doubling the amount of prep time they're getting before the exam and then ending the course a quarter early so they can take another class and take the exam and be ready to go. So the only courses that will be that three quarter block will be the AP classes and those will be 88 minutes a day, but for three quarters of the year. Okay, so those will be a full block. Correct. Okay. Now the skinny classes that go the whole year, but they're only about half the time of a block. So Correct. Could they take two skinnies in that block time. Yep, exactly. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Who's next? <laughs> Did you have one? No. So with the AP classes, so you said that they're only they go only th through three quarters. Correct. But the exam is still at the end of the year. It's not at the end of the block of the The course. exam is at the beginning of May. So the quarter quarter three typically ends around mid-April, and then we have vacation. So there's going to be, including vacation, a two to three week period of time where they don't have the course. Excluding vacation, it's about two school weeks. But again, the amount of prep time they have before the exam is literally doubled from what they currently have now. So even though they don't have those two weeks with their teacher, those two school weeks, they have double the amount of minutes to have done the prep, had feedback from the teacher, delved into the concepts, 
Um, so they'll be much more prepared going into the exam. And there's always this awkward, having taught AP classes, there's this very awkward seven week period of time after the exam where the learners have accomplished what they took the course for and is always like, okay, what's meaningful for them now? So that problem is also eliminated with them getting a new course. If they're um, sophomores, for example, taking AP European history for juniors and seniors, it could be another course, or it could end up being that they take that as a junior or senior block and, and basically have that time to feel good about their exam and, and move on. Um, learners will still have access to AP Classroom, which is, which is a resource through College Board that they have now. And I was talking to some of the AP teachers and they can be communicating with learners through AP Classroom, checking in with them. And so they've, even after the courses end, so they'll have access to that classroom um, until the exam occurs. So they can have those resources available to them. And that is an exact topic that came up as I was working with teachers this week. Many of the AP teachers are very um, mindful that, oh, we'll have this little bit of a break. And they're thinking of ways now about how we can address those needs and continue to support the learners even through vacation if they need to. Thank you. So they all have College Board accounts, and that's where they registered for their AP exam. So AP Classroom. We got one right over here. <laughs> All right. So the email that will be sent to parents, is that sent tomorrow? Yes, we're more towards, oh, sorry. yes um, probably more towards the end of the day. Okay. So you'll get receive all of the resources we shared with your learners today, um, and including the program of studies. And the freshman foundation, is that half a credit or full credit? It's a full credit. Okay. I know it's a little confusing because it's a, it only takes um, place during half the year, um, but it is, they'll do a, a full credit's worth of work. One of the things that our district has done really well is align with the state law on awarding of credit, which is that we award credit based on learning goals and not seat time. So the freshman foundations course has a full credits worth of learning goals, some of which will continue after the course, they'll create a personal learning plan and continue working with their counselor. So we're very confident that even though that class will only meet half of the year for a skinny, they'll still earn a full credit with the work that they're doing that will continue, you know, through the remainder of high school. I do have another question. Sure. Um, and I'm sure it'll be on this, but you said eight credits for freshmen and choosing two alternative credits, correct? And then in the information that will be sent out to us, is there an outline um, in particular if your child already is looking for college of what they should be looking for to be planning out, that'll all be sent out as well. Yeah, so the, a lot of that information is in the program of studies. So we were talking with learners today about the fact that our program of studies is about 83 pages long, which is a lot, but um, in the course description start on page 50, because it provides you a lot of guidance on what courses you, a learner may want to take, um, depending on their, um, we call it a career pathway. So are they intended that we know that that may change over time, but it does make course recommendations from freshman year through senior year. That page count is intimidating because we have probably 15 or more where a full page is just a grid that says, if, you, if this is your career path, here's what we would recommend for four years of courses. So it's not a lot of reading in that case, but it's, it's a nice outline to look at. And then each of our course descriptions, some of which aren't available for a grade level, so you just skip over them, but the, some of the course descriptions provide a lot of information. So those take up a chunk of space too. So we don't expect anybody to be reading 83 pages, you know, cover to cover, that would be a lot. Well, some of us do, I suppose, some of us do, but for the most part, most people look at the policies, which is the beginning, and then skim through and look at the graphs and then, you know, at the courses they're interested in, that's where they really drill in. Um, the three quarter blocks for the AP courses, you said were 1.5 credits. Correct. And then, so those quarter blocks will be 0.5, right? So they're not going to lose any credits if they're taking those because that exactly. was one of the concerns. Yep. So uh, your quarter that, credit is yeah, a half credit. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, yep. Exactly right. You're exactly right. Okay. A learner who takes an AP class and then a one quarter elective gets two credits for the course of the year between okay. those two courses. And if it's not an AP class, it's a regular class and it's in the regular block, it's one credit. You got right? it. Yep. Okay. So do you yep. Do that? Yep. So a learner who has no schedule all year 
will earn eight credits over the course of the year if, if they pass all their classes and things like that. So what I didn't share tonight and I should have shared is, um, and what we did share with learners, is that next week school counselors will be available during office hours and in the counseling office um, to provide support. So there's a lot of questions, how does it all fit together, right? So here are the courses that I wanna take, but what does that look like in my schedule? And even though we provided our learners with like a blank schedule to fill it in, we realize that it's challenging and difficult. So we can spend time helping them map that out to make sure that they have the right number of credits to make sure that all those courses fit together. What does it look like? Um, we did tell learners that it's a mock schedule, so it doesn't mean that it will look exactly like that, but we realize that this is new um, and can be a little challenging at times, um, to, and especially with a short turnaround time. So we let learners know that they would be getting an email from us, letting us know when we'd be available, and they can pop in, they can see us, they can send us an email, we're happy to follow up with them. The thing about turning the course selection sheet into us by next Friday is so that we can begin to make sure we have an understanding of what our learners are looking for, but also so we can be begin meeting with our learners. Our juniors will all have one-on-one um, -on -one meetings with school counselors to make sure everything is set. And then we'll continue to meet with learners one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, even after they turned in the course selection sheet. So it doesn't mean changes can't happen or we can't fix mistakes or answer questions that learners have about certain courses. We just wanna have those sheets in hand as part of that conversation. Any other questions from the live audience? Okay, I'll reclaim both microphones. <laughs> All right, I do see one question from the um, remote audience at this time. Um, let me just get to it. So will students going into seventh grade need to choose courses for next year or will courses be set for them while in middle school? So se seventh grade, the selections are limited to some UA choices, which would be um, if they wanna take a specific art class that's offered just to seventh and eighth graders. I think we have comic book art and 3D art as one example. All of our seventh graders will take a language that's either French or Spanish. So the choice there is, do I wanna take French or do I wanna take Spanish? Um, if they have a preference for a specific type of music that they wanna take next year in seventh grade, you get some choice with that. So we have ukuleles that they can take in seventh grade, they can take chorus and band, they can take steel drums, I think guitar and piano is a seventh grade class. And those things are outlined in the program of studies, but options for STEM um, core classes like English, math, science, those things are pretty much set for seventh graders. So it's really just those those um, elective sort of UA courses that they can select. There is an opportunity for learners who might be advanced in specific areas. Um, math usually comes to mind where there's some question about what that might look like. And Mrs. Shulman will be working with our sixth grade team to look at some diagnostics and things like that, that can determine which sixth grade learners might need to take an eighth grade math class, for example. But for the most part, the course selection for seventh grade is limited to just a very small amount of courses. And we're working currently with the seventh to pick a day next school is it with seventh graders and their for vacation or right after vacation graders around the trend seventh grade and if the question was specifically about current seventh graders selecting for next year eighth graders so rising eighth graders have a little bit more choice um, they have more access to high school classes they'll be continuing the language they started this year um, a lot of the art classes, it's usually art and music and some STEM options that we see. We are introducing woodworking next year that will be open to eighth graders that will earn its eighth, eighth grade, ninth graders primarily. So that can earn some high school credit and is an exciting option for our middle school eighth graders. So rising eighth graders have even a little more choice than seventh grade. And we've built that intentionally. So as they progress through middle school, learn access to what it means to set goals, to start looking at choices for, for courses. And by the time they get to eighth grade and make that big leap into high school, they've got and deciding what courses they want to take. Any other digital audience questions? Uh, we just got one other one. Sure. 
if classes start to fill up, is preference given to seniors or is it first come first serve? So we typically give um, preference in descending order um, with seniors and then working down from there. Obviously seniors are at the end of their educational pathway. So we want them to have first access to make sure they get all the courses that they want and need. We don't anticipate having a huge challenge with that. Um, even with the seven period schedule, most of our scheduling challenges were actually in the middle school where a lot of our courses were very full this year and adding this additional instructional period will alleviate a lot of that pressure for the middle school classes, which we're excited about. Um, but we will, if we do get a course that's filled, give preference to seniors first and then roll backwards from there. Are there any other questions from the live audience or the digital audience? Yeah, just a quick reminder to the digital audience, if you want to be addressed, you can use the hand raise feature and then we can uh, get you there. Yep, Mike. So I think this year, junior block was kind of mandatory and it's great, she loves it. Is junior block, and is there even a senior block? Is that mandatory for next year? Or is that just optional or is it non-existent? So junior block or senior block will happen only if there's a, a hole in a learner's schedule that the learner and their parent opt not to fill with a class. So we don't make it mandatory. If a learner wants to fill their schedule all the way, I, I encourage that because I remind learners you get one free public education and it ends when you graduate high school. So if there's a ceramics class, for example, it doesn't matter if you're a senior, if you've never taken ceramics and it interests you take the class, but um, we will continue to make that an option for learners. And certainly if they wanna fill their schedule, we'll help them to do that. Would that be like a block class or would it be a skinny? Ceramics? No, if, if they did like a senior. It could be block. any any hole in a junior or senior yeah. schedule gets filled with a senior or junior block as long as they meet the minimum course requirements. So the minimum number of classes. And just for clarification, junior block means on campus. We have three locations that juniors have been extremely good this year at being at. I've been so proud of them because this is the first year we've had junior block. And we started out a little rocky because they wanted to be in the lobby. And that's not the greatest place for hanging out. Um, but we allow juniors to be in the lobby. And there's, as you saw when you came in, if you've been in the building, a nice seating area. Usually there's three learners out there. They've been, several of the groups have imposed on themselves no technology times on Fridays, which I think is really fun and they play cards or they chat or they do homework together. The cafeteria is another option where some learners go. Very quiet down there. Again, always very respectful. And then in the library, we have a glassed in space that's been designed as sort of a lounge area for the learners in there. Again, it's been, they've been wonderful this year. So juniors can choose one of those three spots for their junior block. They can socialize appropriately or do schoolwork. And the requirement for that is having good academic standing, which means passing courses, having acceptable work habits above a two and things like that. Seniors who are in that same, you know, um, appropriate academic standing sort of threshold can leave campus with parent permission. So that's the difference between juniors and seniors. Yep. All right. We do have another question. Um, this one is what happens if a senior gets a course at Conval and it gets dropped? Will you have better courses for selection? Yeah, unfortunately this year, you know, for the most part, our Conval connections have worked out fine as they typically do. We have had two instances this year where we've had first firefighting and then EMT where there's a course threshold sign up that we've been notified of after the course has taken place. Um, we're hoping to have better communication when that happens so we don't get caught off guard. But the goal is to make sure when there is an issue like that, that we can quickly pivot either to another partnership We've been working on finding seats at the Cheshire Career Center in Keene for some learners where there has been a disconnect with Conval or Messenic. Um, we had some bumpiness with the automotive program this year that we found a seat in Keene for that, was, that worked out well. Um, we have some cosmetology learners this year who went to Keene. So that's one option we look at is do we have another place where that canceled course exists where we can tuition the learners at a comparable cost and we'll seek to make that happen. The other option is that we'll try to find another course here or online that can support them. So one of our goals is to figure out where the, the gap was with Conval this year and fix that, but also continue to provide more options for those learners. It doesn't happen often, but um, it is, it's frustrating for us when that occurs as well. And I keep looking at you because you're the audience person, but <laughs> I should look here. All right, we have another one. Sure. Um, 
if a student is primarily taking online courses, is there still an on-campus requirement or is it just that the student is taking a certain number of classes and fulfilling requirements? We don't currently have any online program for Conan High School um, as a district. So there are some learners who have enrolled in VLAX, for example, and those learners would continue to be in that program. If there's a specific question about a learner who's been doing an alternative learning plan, that would need to be addressed with our school counseling team. It'd be hard for me to answer a specific question like that um, in a forum like this, but all of our courses are currently on campus and in person. And there are some things that we'd wanna make sure, especially with seniors, that we take a look at around what that looks like for graduation policy and things like that. So I would encourage that question to reach out to Mrs. Baker as our counseling director, and we can sort of discuss that um, directly with that parent. While we're giving one last chance for any questions, we are planning two additional forums for information at each forum. We'll start off with block piece just to make sure that parents who maybe missed this opportunity have another chance to ask questions about that schedule shift. But this time you may have noticed that the bulk of the discussion was about the scheduling process and program of studies. We will be replacing that portion at our next um, forum with some information on standards-based one through four grading system, which our district has been slowly moving towards, and next year our middle school in particular is using a tool called Otis that our district has, has been doing some professional learning on and things like that. So the next forum will focus some time on the one through four grading and what that's going to look like, especially in the middle school next year. And the last forum will have a focus on one through four grading in the high school level, um, what that looks like on transcripts and things like that as we continue moving slowly in that direction. So we'll continue to have some block scheduling information, but we want parents to be aware. We'll have some more informational forums coming down the road and the dates for those will come out. You know, the next one will be four to six weeks after this one. And the last one will be over the summertime. And that third one, the goal is to have some post-secondary folks in attendance with us as well to answer questions that families may have about that piece. So with that said, are there any other questions digitally or in person about tonight's presentation? Nothing digitally. Anything else in person? Absolutely. Let me grab the hopefully not broken mic that rolled on the floor. Sorry about that, Nick. That's okay. Do you happen to know yet what you are doing with the French 4 and French 5 classes? That is a fantastic question. We have to see our signups for those um, classes before we'll know for sure. This year, we were not able to run either of the AP courses for language because we only had one or two learners for each of those. Our hope is that flexibility of having additional instructional period for each of those teachers, Mr. Tenters and Mr. McClung, that we'll be able to offer those even with lower signups, but we have to see the signups first. So encourage your peers who are in French 3 or Spanish 3 to sign up for French 4, Spanish 4, or AP. Okay, thank you. It's a great question. Anything else? Thank you for those who came out in person. Really appreciate it. We appreciated the wonderful questions. And for the digital audience as well, um, if there are any other questions, I would encourage you to reach out to Mrs. Baker, um, she's our scheduling guru, post-secondary guru, future life planning guru, or to myself, Mrs. Sami or Mrs. Shulman, if you have any other questions that you feel we can answer as well, we're happy to, to do what we can to answer questions and help families navigate the scheduling process. Have a great evening.